Thank you, Pastor Shrifley. What a message. Please go home right now. Maybe we have to be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is um, Psalms 46. Psalms 46, verses 1 to 11. Psalms 46, verses 1 to 11. God is our refuge and strength, a present help. Sorry. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swelling. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged and kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two, and he burns the chariot in fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. Pastor, the pulpit's yours, and we look forward to your message. Thank you. Indeed, it's a privilege for us to be here today. I feel like this is our second home now. We've been here that often, and we do appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you from time to time. I love the lesson study this morning, this idea of family, Tom. You know, we can be family together. We can make our little mistakes, and we're forgiven. That's part of being family. We can do things in a less than perfect way and not be subject to criticism. That, too, is part of a family, you know. And there's always that helping hand saying, you can do better, we appreciate what you're doing. In grade school, I don't know why I ever memorized it. I don't feel it was a class assignment, but a poem that was written by a Canadian doctor serving in Belgium during World War I, May 13. I guess it was found in his notes because he wrote it one day and the next day he was killed in action. In Flanders Fields, by the way, some of you remembered your poppies today. My wife had to remind me to put my poppy on. I got it a week or so ago. <laughs> and in Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunsets glow, loved and were loved, and now, we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. The poppies grow in Flanders fields. What is it that we remember? Today we're going to be talking about war. For a number of years, I was a teacher at the grade school level. Junior high was the area I loved the most, although I taught a bit of high school. I actually have taught everything from grade one to PhD and pretty well everything in between once or twice in my life. 
But the, one of the fascinating things that I used to enjoy in Canadian history was an old set of reel-to-reels called Canada at War. I imagine you can find newer black and white editions of them on the internet somewhere. But as we learned about the story of the war, we learned that that First World War was characterized as the Great War. It was called the War to End All Wars. I remember the, the film strip particularly. It was black and white, you know, the jerky ones, because back in 1914, that was all they had of the Canadian forces boarding ship heading to Europe. There was almost a festive, festive air as our soldiers, our Canadian soldiers, headed off to, to the theater of the war in Europe. They were going to... I don't want to use the word. They were going to kick and you fill in the blank. They were going to show this tyrant who he was and we'll be home for Christmas. We'll have the job done. That was the attitude. This was going to be the war to end all wars. That's the way it was characterized. And there was this belief that they would be home for Christmas. That when this was done, the world would be a safe place forever. Well... As the war dragged on and one Christmas after another came and went, it became clear that this was not a great war, nor was it a war to end all wars. There were, there were countless acts of bravery, outstanding courage, and personal sacrifice, which we remember at this time of year especially, we remember and celebrate. The war produced some real heroes. You know, conflict often reveals what people are really made of. And we remember that in a large measure we owe our freedom today to those who stood against tyranny, who stood against dictatorship, and were willing to make the supreme sacrifice. But as we look back, it is very evident that World War I was not a war to end all wars, nor was it a great war. Indeed, I'm not sure if there is any such thing as a great war when you look at, in, in, look at outcomes, at least from a human perspective. Was there anything glamorous about the fighting, about the destruction, about the loss of lives? Just as we so often do, those who entertain these notions were failing to see the big picture, to see the truly big picture. You see, war didn't originate on Earth. The big picture shows us that war is something bigger than what we see on planet Earth today. The real war began thousands of years before World War I, in fact, even before the creation of our world. World War I, World War II, the Korean War, all the other wars and skirmishes in human history have been but small sections of the greatest war. All of the conflicts that continue to plague our planet on Earth today are only part of the bigger picture. The greatest war, the real war to end all wars, began in heaven of all places long before the creation of our world. The book of Revelation, the Apostle John writes these words, and there was war in heaven. Come on. War in heaven, Michael, Jesus Christ, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. And the great dragon, the devil, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Jesus declared, and this you can find in Luke, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven, referring to this time that the revelator speaks about before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the world. So how did this real war begin in heaven? Heaven, a perfect place of all places. There's a couple of special Old Testament passages that give us the picture of what really happened. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14 tells how Lucifer had the desire. Lucifer, who has now become Satan, the enemy, had the desire to take over God's throne. And Isaiah prophesies of his ultimate end. Let me read just three verses there. Verse 12, this is Isaiah 14, verses 12, 13, and 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? Verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
in a perfect world, in a perfect heaven, a perfect God was challenged by a, beating, uh, by a being that had been created perfectly. You cannot give an excuse for what happened in heaven. There is no excuse because if there was an excuse or a reason for what Lucifer did, it would cease to be sin. Ezekiel 28 tells of Lucifer's pride and his propaganda efforts to actually undermine the throne of God and put the angels on his side against the love of, against God. How he worked in, as an underhanded lobbyist, if you please, a peddler of counterfeit merchandise. That's in the language of the, the original language. Ezekiel 28, verse 12 and 14, we'll read a few verses from that one. Thus saith the Lord God, speaking to this angel turned rebel, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. This is where Lucifer had been. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the, the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. Merchandise, traffic. Those two words, those two English words come from the same root word in the original language, and the picture is clearly of a door-to-door -door peddler going about, spreading lies to undermine the God of the universe because he wanted to take over the throne that was occupied righteously by our God. What a sad thing. And so began the great war in heaven, the war that John the Revelator spoke of in which Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, the truly great war that by many has been called the great controversy. That is the story of the great war. How will it end? Because you and I are in the middle of what's, well, we're toward the end of it, fortunately, but we're still kind of caught in the crossfire. Through the temptation and fall of Adam and Eve, the great conflict between good and evil that originated in heaven, the conflict between Christ and Satan has shifted to our world. All of the wars that we see are but skirmishes in the larger drama. The trouble, the sickness, the tragedy, the injustice, the personal trauma that we experience all find explanation in this larger picture. I think it's important that we realize that because so often people ask the question and they become skeptical of the love of God. If God is a God of love, why do bad things happen to good people? The answer is in the great controversy theme. The answer is in understanding the war and how the God of heaven was the one who was put on the defensive. He was the accused. Where does he go to take his court case? Where does he go for a hearing? The conflict is being lived out, and the evidence is being submitted by your life and mine in this. So our world has become the stage, the theater of the universe, where the conflict of the ages is being played out, where we'll ultimately end with the triumph of God's love. The Apostle Paul declares, we are made a spectacle. The Greek word there is theater. The act, we're the actors on the stage. That's, it's the cast more than it is the place where you go to watch the, watch the action. It is the action. We are made the theater of the universe. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. The angels of heaven are watching what is happening here. The evil angels are watching what is happening here. And of course, they're all influencing or doing their best to influence it to one side or another. And that idea of a theater is a public show a gazing stock, something that the universe is looking at. We are being watched. Even here today, we are being watched by, uh, by heavenly beings and by evil angels. Now, after any war on earth, there are far-reaching consequences. The larger the conflict, the more the following consequences will, will apply. For too many, there is no future at all. Those are the casualties. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Men lose their lives. People caught in the crossfire. People that are hated groups lose their lives for no reason other than they were born in the wrong bed. 
Among the survivors are the wounded, the displaced, the disenchanted, and the emotionally scarred. Talk about PST. Have you heard anything about that lately? What soldier cannot come back from the theater of a war without PST? I think it would be a universal problem. Often the survivors return to a battered and decimated it has been said that one of the causes of World War II was the settlement of World War I in which Germany was saddled with the bill of paying all the repairs that the war had cost all of the Allies. It doesn't work that way, does it? You, you, you can't, there, there's a decimated country. Somebody's got to pay to rebuild, to restore, to put buildings back together, to restore infrastructure, to replace bridges that have been blown apart, to repair airport runways, whatever it takes to restore everything that is damaged by the war. And there are often economic crises as the country tries to return to normal because there is no normal according to the past. It's going to be a different normal, a new normal. Sometimes there is no normal in the future. Too often the future continues to be filled with conflict, foreboding, hatred, like there is no future. That's the way it's been with every war from, uh, from ancient times right up to the present wars that are being fought in the world today. But when the great war, the truly great war between Christ and Satan is over, the picture is different according to Scripture. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, verses 3 and 4, And I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God is coming to live on planet Earth with us to be our God, and we will be his people. Those are covenant promises. Let me read on. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That sounds like the new covenant. It is. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's a powerful picture. At the end of the Great War, things are going to be different from the ending of any other war that we've ever witnessed. <coughs> Isaiah says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. Remember that poem? You know, the tiger, on the other hand, is kittenish and mild. He makes a pretty playfellow for any little child. And mothers of large families who claim to common sense will find a tiger well repays as a babysitter, a tiger. That was a foolish poem. I don't know why I memorized that. The first one was about the lion. You wouldn't want to trust your child to a lion, but a tiger, on the other hand, you see, that was the contrast in that foolish ditty. I memorized that in school, too. I don't know, you know, some of these delightful things. But this isn't the picture in Isaiah. There the mother can trust her little child with a tiger. You see? But I love this. So, and Isaiah goes on, And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Lions are not going to be looking at you as the next item on their menu. They're just not. Verse 9, And they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Everybody. Well, isn't that another new covenant promise? They will all know me from the least to the greatest. You're not going to teach every man his brother and every man his neighbor. The new covenant is to be fulfilled literally in this new order of things that result when the truly great war finally comes to, it end, to its end. First Corinthians, Paul says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. A perfect world where people don't even die anymore. There won't be any more wars. I heard somebody say, amen. We should be clapping at that. That is a, if it was a black church, you probably would be, you know. <laughs> I've, I've sat in some churches and I say, oh, I wish somebody would say amen, you know, you know. And then I go to the black churches. Unfortunately, somebody has the courage to say, preach it, brother. You know, <laughs> preach it, brother. I love that when they say it. My German background doesn't let me say it, but I love it when others say it, you know. And uh, this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. That's from 1 John 2, 25. This is the new order that will finally come into existence after the, or at the end of the great war that was the war to end all wars. Historians and war analysts tell us that 
The outcome of a war, a human war that is, is often determined not when the last bullet is fired or when the last bomb is detonated or the last army is defeated, but at some decisive moment or event, often months or even years before hostilities actually cease. In the real war to end all wars, Calvary was just such a decisive moment. The outcome was made certain, but the hostilities have still continued for some time since then. You see, at Calvary, although Jesus appeared to be defeated to those who could see only the smaller picture, it was really Satan who lost out. Jesus won a stellar victory on Calvary. In the great controversy between Christ and Satan, the intensity of the struggle is increasing as we approach its grand climax because the enemy does not easily give up. He does not easily concede defeat. Each of us, that's you and me, is serving as a soldier, a combatant, and too often becomes a casualty on one side or the other. You cannot be not involved in this war. Each of us is a combatant on one side or the other. But who will be the final victor is no longer in doubt. Jesus Christ, remember, won the battle of Calvary. And he will soon set up his kingdom just as the prophet Daniel declared to Nebuchadnezzar so long ago. Daniel 2.44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom, a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's an eternal kingdom. Amen. That is the outcome. I think we need to make some contrasts between human wars on one hand and the truly great war on the other. Human wars began in heaven, of all places, with one who desired to climb to the heights of the me first uh, pinnacle and become ruler over all, while the truly great war climaxes with one, capital O on the word one, by the way, who was willing to be last of all and servant of all. Think of the difference. One in a high position wanted to be even higher, the other in the highest position was willing to go down and down and down and down. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and became as a servant. And he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus said, this is contrasting two wars again contrasting the human wars and the great war. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants fight. Yet there is a fight to fight, not with carnal weapons, but we are to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, as Paul says in 1 Timothy. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Think about that. The wars of human history take place on battlefields of noise and destruction. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, so Isaiah said. But the genuine war to end all wars takes place of all place in human minds and hearts. That's where the real battle is in human minds and hearts. The wars of human history are conducted on principles of brute strength and selfishness, but the truly great war is won by love, unselfishness. In the wars of human history, victory is the consequence of shrewd planning and brute strength. But in the genuine war to end all wars, victory and winning come with surrender. When do you win a war by surrender? Although as winners we are to enter heaven as conquerors, that's you and me, because I believe that's the side we're on. Although we, are, we will enter heaven as conquerors, it is not heaven nor God that we have conquered. It is ourselves. 
and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of Jesus Christ, you know? In the wars of human history, the spoils go to the victor and the costs of the reconstruction are assigned to the loser, right? Winner takes all. Germany, you pay for the reparations to fix everything, your war damaged. It's your war, your fault, you fix it, okay? But in the truly great war, the spoils are awarded to the loser. Oh, the one who was thought to be the loser, that is, who was the real winner. And the costs of reconstruction are borne by the winner. Who is it that pays to remake the world after the thousand years? Jesus Christ. There's a lot of contrast. In the wars of human history, the prisoners are broken people, dragged along by force to magnify the prowess of the victor. Think of Daniel and his companions getting dragged in chains from the defeated, destroyed city, their homeland, Jerusalem, into Nebuchadnezzar's proud kingdom. They were the spoils of victory. Can you, can you picture them running along the stooped shoulders, probably in rags and tatters, thirsty and hungry, feet dirty, haven't had a bath in two months or maybe more, <coughs> coming in here and the people are cheering and cheering there and making fun of the captors. Embarrassed, but worse than that, a dead fear in their hearts. What does the future hold? We're at the total mercy of one who's dragging us here in chains. And for many, there was no future. Slavery or execution could happen just as easily as, as any other alternative. And that was the most likely. Picture these dejected people coming this way as a parade of captives to magnify, to extol the power of the victor. But in the truly great war, the, they are prisoners of love, willingly singing the praises of their divine captor, of their divine conqueror held together by the cords of love. There's no chain that makes them follow the Lamb wherever he goes. It's not there. It's the cords of love that bind hearts together as a big family of God throughout eternity. The Bible describes them as shouting with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And from heaven comes the challenge. Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? Revelation 7, 13. And listen to the descriptive uh, response in the next verse. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And in Revelation 14, we find even more detail. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. What a beautiful picture is the ending of the truly great war, the war to end all wars. Whether or not we are able to see the bigger picture, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, has already won the great war. And this genuine war to end all wars is producing its own roster of war heroes, men and women of outstanding character and courage, men and women who live by the faith of the Son of God who loved them and gave himself for them, men and women who at great sacrifice and personal cost have stood up against the real enemy, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Today, we remember our war heroes and all those who have fought in the great wars of this last century. Remember, tomorrow is the 100th anniversary of the signing of the, uh, the truce, the, the peace settlement that finally said World War I is over, 100 years ago tomorrow. The thousands of men and women, named and unnamed, who have worked and fought so that we may live today in freedom, we remember these today. But in the final analysis, it is Jesus Christ who is to be declared the greatest war hero of all. I love that. Jesus Christ is the greatest war hero of all who worked and fought so that all who will may have real freedom, eternal freedom.
And all around us, brothers and sisters, are signs that the truly great war is nearing its end. The day is soon coming when, as the Apostle Paul declares, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Looking forward to that grand homecoming, looking forward to the time when war will be no more, let us sing together the words of our closing, our closing song. I think this is one that most of you will know, and if you don't, it's an opportunity to learn it.